don't know me, I'm Tanaz Farsi, and I teach in the art department. And on behalf of the art department, I would like to welcome all of you to this evening's lecture. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Helen Molesworth as this year's Fowler Lecture. The George and Matilda Fowler Lecture was established in 2002 by Constance Fowler in memory of her parents to promote a wider understanding of the ideas that inform art. Since Mrs. Fowler's passing, her niece Connie has been a wonderful and generous supporter of the Department of Art, carrying forward her aunt's mission to bring provocative speakers to the University of Oregon. Helen joins us from Boston, where she is the chief curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art. She has also served as the head of the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museum, where she organized the first survey on the work of the photographer Moira Davy and allowed us to examine the enduring legacy and marks of AIDS on our culture with the exhibition Act Up New York, Activism, Art, and, AIDS, and the AIDS Crisis, 1987 to 1993. Prior to joining Harvard, Helen was the chief curator of exhibitions at the Wexner Center for Arts in Columbus, Ohio. And this is where, as a graduate student, I became, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to become familiar with her practice as a scholar, writer, and a curator. Some of the most influ influential works that I have experienced were part of the exhibitions that Helen curated at the Wexner, such as the video and photographic work of Phil Collins, the first museum survey of Louise Lawler, as well as works by Josiah McElhenney, Rachel Harrison, Alan McCollum, Andrea Fraser, uh, Robert Gober, the, the list goes on. And it was not only the works of these artists, but Helen's framework that sent me spiraling back into my studio full of resolves on the way Art making creates an important and steadfast conversation with contemporary culture. Multiple notable traveling shows emanated out of her time at the Wexner, such as landscape confections, part object, part sculpture, image stream, and work ethic. Each of these exhibitions also produced substantial documents where leading scholars in the field were brought together by Helen to grapple with issues of historicization, feminism, labor, erotics of objects, and the social frameworks of contemporary art. Tonight, she will present her lecture. This will have been Art, Love, and Politics in the 1980s. Please join me in welcoming Helen Molesworth. Hi. I thought all the, I am, I feel like Clint Eastwood, like I've got two microphones on. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure in the booth that everything's okay. All right. Um, thanks to Naz for that introduction and also for inviting me to come and speak uh, and be in Eugene where I've, I've, this is my first trip to, to Oregon and um, uh, it's great to be here, um, and thank you all for coming. Oh, I hate this moment. Um, this is the terrifying moment. Okay, how many people in this room were born uh, before 1980? All right, now for the scarier show of hands. How many people in this room were born after 1980? All right, this is what I fear might happen this evening. <laughs> I'm going to present a revision of the standard sort of way of thinking about the 80s, but I've got this sinking suspicion that the vast majority of you have yet to be uh, inculcated with the bad version of the 80s. <laughs> so I don't know how the whole revision thing is going to read. Um, which also puts me in the bad position of having set up for you what could become the dominant reading of the 80s, which then, of course, you have to overturn <laughs> in just a few short years. Um, so we'll, we'll see how how this all goes. Um, okay, here's another question. How many people in the room uh, know 
um, personally, people who died of AIDS and HIV-related causes. And how many of you don't? All right, so all of you who don't, stand up. Okay, so um, here's how the 80s went. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down. No, no, no. I'm pointing at you. Sit down. 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 Down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Down, down. You two, down. All three of you in the back, down. Okay, all of you guys who just sat down died of HIV AIDS during the years 1983 to 1989. If you're standing next to somebody right now, you're just, okay, if you're standing, if you're not standing next to someone, sit down. You guys died in 1989. And the rest of you who are standing, maybe some of you make it past 96. Maybe. If you made it to 96, you were lucky enough to get the cocktail. And so you can sit. That's one version of how it felt to live through the 80s. It was random, it was fast, and it happened to people your age. It was really, really, really bad. Um, now, of course, it's different, right? Because AIDS is a chronic manageable condition. Um, treatable, it's not a death sentence, but it once was a death sentence. And for for my way of thinking, um, it's really one of two defining uh, things that happened in the 1980s. Um, and there's just, there's no way for me to think about the period um, as if I could go back to like some innocent time before the disease. It'd be like going to a World War II movie and acting like you didn't know how it ended. You know, like, <laughs> we won. <laughs> I hope I haven't ruined anything for you. <laughs> um, but I found when I was thinking about the 80s and trying to think about what it would mean to make a show about the art of the 1980s, that I couldn't begin um, outside of that extraordinary loss and the kind of um, the traumatic nature of that loss. And the traumatic nature of that loss is several fold. Um, it was traumatic because by 1992, more Americans had died of HIV AIDS than American soldiers were killed in the Vietnam War. So the loss was profoundly large. A lot of the people who died, and I mean a lot of the people who died, were in their 20s and 30s and 40s. So what it meant was that young people died. Uh, and the other thing that made it so terrifying and so traumatic was that even though AIDS is sort of known about in the early part of the decade, you know, by like 81, 82, there's this idea that there's a gay cancer. By 85, it's, it's, it's known it's a virus, it's known how it's transmitted. Um, but the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, doesn't say the word AIDS publicly until 1987, by which time almost 50,000 people have died. Now, you remember that H1N1 flu thing? 
right? You remember like the national hysteria around a flu? Like there was nothing about that around AIDS or HIV. There was just silence, political silence, silence on the part of the medical establishment. And so it really did feel like at a certain moment in New York and I think in San Francisco and in LA that everybody was going to die. Everyone you knew, all your friends who were cool, all your friends who were gay, all your friends who were musicians, all your friends who were artists, just felt like nobody was really going to make it. Um, and so I, it's not the kind of intro to this talk that I give when I'm talking to um, uh, an audience of non-students. But I find that when I talk to students, I need to kind of um, set up a, f a framework of intensity um, and randomness and arbitrariness uh, as a way to at least get a little bit of a sense of this huge medical and political crisis that forms both the backdrop and the foreground of everything that's happening. So, all right, now we, can, now we can do something a little different. So, a couple of years ago, um, I read this great quote from the poet David Anton, uh, and apparently someone had asked David Anton how he was. David Anton's like in his 70s. And he said that he was waiting for minimalism to die. I thought that was hilarious because I thought, I too, I hadn't known it, but I too was waiting for minimalism to die. <laughs> I was getting a little tired of talking about Donald Judd all the time. I'm, I like talking about Judd some of the time, but there was a sense in which the art world, and by that I mean the museum world and art history classes and the magazines, that there was a, a kind of current fetish for the 60s and the 70s. And the eight, and then there, so there was like 60s and 70s, and then boom, relational aesthetics. That was what you got to talk about. Which meant that you didn't basically talk about the period from 1979 to 1992. You didn't talk about the 80s. And I got really interested in why weren't we talking about the 1980s? And I realized that for a lot of us, we weren't talking about it because it's embarrassing. It's, um, a, it's a time of many embarrassing things. There's Dallas, there's Dynasty, there's shoulder pads, there's toe socks, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot to steer away from the 80s. Um, there was a moment where the market really shifted and the 80s got kind of all bombastic and the art world got filled with money. There's that schnabel moment. Um, and it seemed like everyone wanted to just sort of avoid any talk of this decade. Uh, and for some reason, I felt, um, I mean, now in retrospect, somewhat stupidly compelled to run into the void um, but what I found in the void actually was really interesting. So what I'm going to do this evening is a little ersatz because I, I haven't yet figured out how to present this exhibition as a talk. Um, the, the exhibition has over, um, it has almost 140 objects in it. So that's clearly not a talk anybody wants to sit through. Um, the essay is almost 20,000 words. That's definitely not a talk anybody wants to sit through. Um, and I'm still in the process of sort of figuring out, the, the show opened in February, and I'm still in the process of shifting from five years of research, five years of writing, five years of thinking, into, okay, now there's now it's there. There's a catalog and there's a show and now trying to figure out what, what the catalog and the show mean. And 
before I get started, I, I think I just want to say a few more things about um, what I think an art exhibition can be uh, and what I hope that this art exhibition is. Um, and they're not all like this, but this one is. Um, I was trained as an art historian. I love art history in that kind of big, geeky way. You know, when you walk through the museum and you're like, Rembrandt, <laughs> David. You know everyone's name. You're like Adam in the garden. And, um, <laughs> and but it's true, right? That laughter is a laughter of self-recognition, I sense. <laughs> There's an e extraordinary degree of pleasure in that kind of naming that happens in the museum. Um, but I also really love exhibitions that, or I try to make exhibitions that are arguments. So I think art history's great form is the essay. And I, I try to make exhibitions that are like a three-dimensional essay, so a spatialized argument. And the argument gets made largely with objects. And in this fantasy, I have that the progression of objects and the arrangement of objects in the room creates a set of conditions that allows you to think certain things. And that on the one hand, as the curator of the exhibition, I am, I am leading you uh, through a story, through a narrative, but that because of the nature of artworks themselves, meaning that they don't obey, like I can make the slides obey. I can always make the slides do exact, tell you exactly the story I want to tell you. But in space, the objects often won't behave exactly the way I want them to. And so other things emerge that are very interesting. But basically the, the exhibition for me, and particularly this one, is, is an argument. So it's not just like what happened in the 80s, but it's a way of thinking about what happened in the 80s. Um, OK, I better start talking. All right. Here we go. This is the opening um, slide, the opening of the show. I'm going to move in between writing, a uh, reading and speaking extemporaneously. All right. This will have been Art, Love, and Politics in the 1980s covers the period from 1979 to 1992. So basically from the American pressing of Nevermind the Bullocks to the election of William Jefferson Clinton. During this era, the political sphere was dominated by the ideas of former US President Ronald Reagan and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. The music scene was transformed by punk and the birth of hip hop, and our everyday lives were radically altered by a host of technological developments from the Sony Walkman to the ATM to the appearance of MTV to the first personal computers. In the United States, the decade opened with an enormous anti-nuclear protest in New York Central Park and closed with mass demonstrations against the government's slow response to the AIDS crisis. The exhibition attempts to make sense of what happened to the visual arts in the United States during this tumultuous period. The artists represented in This Will Have Been belong to the first generation of artists to grow up with a television in the home. So most of the artists in this show were born in the late 1940s or the early 1950s. And I think as art historians, we've done a lot of work about the relationship between photography and painting. I don't think we've done nearly enough work about the role of television. Uh, and, it, and actually, it will, for, the, for the students in the room, you know, maybe you guys can do the TV work because you're so past TV. Like, you're all computer screen based. So you might be able to understand something about TV mm -hmm. that those of us who grew up with the TV, in a way, can't. Um, these artists came of age in a culture saturated with visual images designed to promote desire. Desire for objects, for lifestyles, for fame, for conformity, for anti-conformity. So too, the majority of the artists in this will have been lived through the heady days of the 1970s feminist movement 
and witness that broad-based social movement's demand for equality in all areas of life, work, family, and intimate relationships. As these powerful social forces, the rise of television, and movements for social justice, primarily the feminist movement, converged, what I'd like to argue is that it was the task of the 1980s to assimilate these sweeping societal changes. For many of the artists in this exhibition, that meant grappling with the following questions. In a world increasingly filled with mass media images, what is the role of the visual arts? How can artists make images that either compete with or counter the powerful images produced by advertising and Hollywood? In a society struggling for increase, increased equality, how do historically marginalized people, women, people of color, and gays and lesbians find their public voice? Towards the end of the decade, as the rise of AIDS created a growing political and medical crisis in the US, these questions only increased in urgency. So the exhibition is divided into four sections, and each section tries to map out a different set of questions or problematics. So the end is near. The idea of the end was pervasive in 1980s cultures. Art magazines were filled with talk of the end of painting. After all, what could this centuries old medium tell us in our mass mediated age? There was much talk of the end of the avant-garde as the image of the artist as an outsider began to feel impossibly naive. The most hotly debated version of the end, however, was the, immersion, was the emergence of the term postmodernism. And this was another reason I got really obsessed with the 80s, because when I was in college, to be cool, which was, after all, what I was primarily interested in being, <laughs> was to have as firm a working grasp of the concept of postmodernism as you could muster as a 19-year-old, <laughs> which I can now admit was slim and shaky, but it, was, it, felt, very, um, it felt really vital to, to, to carve yourself out for away from modernism into postmodernism. Um, so what did postmodernism signal? Uh, it signaled, I think, really first and foremost, the end of any kind of belief in history as either a monolithic narrative or a set of objective facts. Instead, what history was, was a narrative that always contained a profoundly distinct point of view. Now, this I realize that, it, again, in an audience of um, students, that might have the quality of like, duh. <laughs> but if, you know, in my freshman year, I think I had to watch that um, Brown, Brownowski, I can't even remember that guy, that, we had to watch a PBS miniseries called The Birth of Man, <laughs> in which literally there were no women until the very end, and then she gave birth to a child. <laughs> And it was the story of Western civilization as if there was one story. I mean, it was this older way of thinking about history, that there was, there was such a thing, you know, called Western civilization that we could all agree on. Uh, and so postmodernism was the moment when you got to sign on to a set of ideas uh, that, that really resisted that kind of monolithic, that, that monolithic version of, um, of history as true. Uh, meanwhile, the culture wars, which resulted from government attacks on art that explicitly addressed sexuality, was seen by many artists as an attempt to end the cultural and social advances of 1960s counterculture. So the 80s is many things, but one of the things it really is, I think, is the official end of the 1960s. Um, the idea of a kind of romantic bohemian counterculture is not the counterculture that we're interested in anymore. 
um, those of us, for instance, in particular, who were interested in punk and then later on hip hop. Uh, in the early winter of 1989, the Berlin Wall was gleefully dismantled. And with its collapse came the end of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union and a realignment of power, culture, and finance on a global scale. New York, although it did not know it yet, was in the midst of being displaced as the center of the art world. And it's fair to say here in Eugene that New York still is not aware that it is no longer the center of the, New York, of the art world, but you know, we, we need to feel compassion for our brothers and sisters in New York City. <laughs> um, but one of the things that was displacing New York as the center of the art world was an awareness of German art uh, and the rise of Los Angeles as a major art center underscored by the increasingly global character of the contemporary art world. So I'm thinking here that 89 is not only the year that the wall falls, but it's also the year of the Pompidou's exhibition, Magicien de la Terre, which is really the first um, sort of flagship exhibition to feature self-consciously a global roster of artists. Yet despite the 1980s various harbingers of the end, by the close of the decade, activists wearing t-shirts and buttons with the slogan, silence equals death, made it clear that for thousands of Americans with AIDS, the end had in fact already come. So what you're seeing is a mixture of um, the kinds of slides I make before a show exists and then the kinds of slides that happen after it's installed. So this is a before shot. Um, and so when I, when I would put works together like this, I was thinking about ideas, primarily ending ideas, the end of art history. Um, so the end of certain kinds of uh, narratives of progression in which we believe that, you know, one style supersedes another style, supersedes another style to some sort of mythic state of um, artistic nirvana. But instead that what we saw in art history was a constant going back to previous forms, pulling them through to the present, that the temporality of art making is is much more complicated. And I think you can see that in the museum on campus, um, like the kinds of objects that the faculty chose, right? They don't choose the object closest to them in time. They frequently are choosing an object from the past and, and pulling it forward in time. Um, and I think that that kind of temporality is um, a really interesting one. Um, other big ideas though that feel like they're coming to an end, one of them was the idea of nature seem to no longer be possible. So in the Jack Goldstein, you have this sort of very romantic image of the natural world and natural phenomenon, but it's completely constructed and completely fabricated and cut and paste from different photographs. And then um, using a spray gun, you know, he's made this very sort of technicolor kind of painting. So there's this idea that there, that our idea of nature is so framed culturally that it doesn't even really exist anymore. Um, other artists toying with idea of the end are artists who are, I think are really thinking through the end. What, what, what do, if postmodernism meant on the one hand an end of a certain version of history and through that ending of ends of versions of hierarchy and authority, um, for many artists it really meant like the end of modernism the end of a certain kind of idea of the purity of form being aligned with certain utopian social programs. And so you have someone like Mary Heilman making like this great witty painting that's a, a, a kind of meditation in a way on something like Malevich's Black Square or an Ad Reinhardt Black Monochrome painting, but she's doing it in the color, of, in the color scheme of punk. Um, and, you know, this kind of goofy, goofy version of modernism. Um, and then you also see someone like Sherry Levine holding this ultimate modernist stripe painting, a la Frank Stella, but she's putting it on a chair seat. So she's flagging the tradition of the ready-made, which was the repressed modernist tradition, but she's also making a painting for your ass. So like there's this kind of ironic 
sense of humor of like, you know, if what you need is a straight painting, you also might want to think about needing a chair. Um, you know, there's this kind of like winking, debunking of any lofty idea. Um, uh, and certainly I think you see that, you know, as well in Peter Halley, you know, where a kind of formalist painting actually ends up looking like the major disciplinary institution of a culture, which is a prism, or Kippenberger's Six Prize, in which, you know, a formalist painting already has written into it that it's won a prize, it, but it's won the sixth prize? That's funny. <laughs> nobody, nobody really wants to win, like, place sixth. <laughs> Not even a postmodernist. Like, it, that's just funny. Um, the end of modernism, however, isn't always funny. There's also something, I think, profoundly melancholic about it that with ends are always feelings of loss. And so that while in the beginning of the 80s, the, the rhetoric and the discourse of postmodernism felt very radical and very liberatory, I think there were also artists like Alan McCollum, whose 10 plaster surrogates you see on the right, or David Solly, whose autopsy you see on the left. Um, as much as they want to give up modernism, as much as they want to give up this kind of formalist language, as much as they want to participate in the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, they're also really, really good at making incredibly sophisticated modernist looking paintings. And that there is a kind of melancholy in the abandonment of some of the ideas of the kind of art for art's sake. You know, that, that, it, that one doesn't give up ideas like humanism or modernism or history lightly. Right, that those are profoundly wrenching um, divorces, basically. Um, again, I was really interested in the 80s as the death of the 60s. Uh, and I was really interested in people like Raymond Pettibone, who, you know, let's face it, like if you live in Venice Beach, you live in like the ground zero of the end of the 60s. You know, I mean, you live in a in a place of, of shattered souls and like utopia gone deeply awry. But I was also interested in Candy Jerrigan, who was, who was living in the Lower East Side, which had been a typically immigrant neighborhood um, and was gentrified as a result of galleries and artists moving into the Lower East Side in the 1980s. And she's what you, it might be hard to see, but her picture on the right is actually uh, it's called Found Dope Part Two, and it's um, a week's worth of crack vials that she's picked up off the street. And I see them almost as she's cataloging them, almost as sweetly as like when you're a kid and you press flowers and you know you write underneath them. Like there's this sweetness to this bohemian taxonomy, but also underneath is this like horrific, edgy, um, terrible drug epidemic. So that you get the sense again of the '60s as as, as a dream world that has um, been twisted past a state of recognition. Um, and then I think the, the thing that, even if you didn't agree about the end of humanism or the end of modernism, most everyone agreed about the end of the avant-garde. The idea that artists were people who were out in front of other people and who knew things and could do things that other people couldn't do, that just got, that just became a fantasy that was increasingly hard to um, believe in. And I think one of the reasons that fantasy became increasingly hard to believe in was the proliferation of the television. That there was this instrument of communi communiality, um, what is the word, uh, commonality, communion, all of those C words <laughs> together in one word. Let them all run together in your head. And that's what the TV was doing. Um, but the TV does create a kind of incredible baseline in which we can all, you know, hum certain tunes or know certain narratives and understand with however much ironic distance we might have but the TV is still actually creating an incredible common language. And that in that common language, there is something about a notion of the avant-garde that, that falls away. 
Uh, and I think Louise Lawler taking this picture of this Delaunay painting, like smashed in a corner behind a Lichtenstein bust that's been turned into a lamp in front of the, tel you know, and behind the TV, is just like this very canny vision of, you know, what has happened. And certainly the Christopher Wool painting, being as nasty as all Christopher Wool paintings are, impossible to read, hard-edged, sort of parsimonious in its relationship to the reader, but it's basically um, a quote from a, a Soviet avant-garde um, play about the show being over, the audience gets up to leave their seats, to uh, turns to collect their coats and go home, they turn around, no more coats, no more home. So again, this pervasive sense of the 80s as a time of of the ending of many, many big ideas. The second section of the exhibition was titled Democracy. The art of the 1980s was shaped profoundly by an exploration of democracy. Although it is an idea held sacred by many, democracy is fundamentally a challenge. For at its core, it asks us to respect and protect the rights of those we disagree with. Which, you know, is a platitude, but one worth um, turning around like a stone in your pocket every now and again. But to be truly, to live in a truly democratic society, we actually all in this room have to sign on to protecting and respecting Rush Limbaugh's right to his deployment of the First Amendment. It's fucking hard to do. <laughs> it's a hard enterprise, the democratic. It is not easy. So for many artists, public spaces such as the street became arenas in which to facilitate encounters with art outside of the rarefied space of the museum. And in this section, one encountered a lot of artworks that used, um, where am I? There we go. Uh, posters, graffiti, and everyday language to broadcast a social message as widely as possible. This interest in the public sphere was complicated, however, by many artists' observation that increasingly television was replacing the street or the public square as a primary site of democratic debate. And so here, for those of you who know your Habermas and your public sphere theory, you can hear like that one of the other things that's happening during this period is a shift in thinking of what exactly and where exactly do we imagine the public to be. And I think this has real ramifications for what's happening in our country right now in terms of Occupy. Um, because the 80s was this moment where the art world really actually kind of splits between the artists who really believe that what you need to do is be outside, right? And that this, this is public art. Or artists who believe that what you need to do is infiltrate the whole idea of television because television is actually the new public sphere. It is the public square. It is the new version of the public. Um, so while some artists grappled with the new role of the mass media in both political and artistic arenas, what both sets of artists encounter, so the people working in the street and the people working with TV, uh, encounter is this issue of belonging, of who has rights to what, where, and when. And that, that kind of language of access lies at the heart of the democratic enterprise. Um, such issues were in fact to be sorely tested in the 1980s along numerous fronts. Several artists whose work appear in this section made explicit use of imminent critique. Um, and imminent critique, um, for those of you who don't know what it is, is a, is a strategy. I mean, basically you can think about the civil rights movement as being the sort of ultimate American formula for imminent critique, which is um, what you do is you hold your government accountable to its highest aspirations. So you use the language that we already have in the Bill of Rights, right? 
um, and we use it and we hold it up to our government and say, we are not living up to this. That's the strategy of imminent critique. Um, what all of the artists represented in this section uh, was that they shared the belief that art can and should serve as a catalyst for philosophical and political debate. And I think this is in many ways, um, when the show opened in Chicago, um, this was actually the thing that people kept talking about, was uh, that they had forgotten this moment of extraordinary urgency when everyone felt that like the art they made and where they showed their art and what they wore to their opening and what you ate and where you lived and everything mattered, right? That everything had a kind of intensity about it because everything was ripe for um, an attempt at changing the status quo. So here what you see is a group of works that I argue um, are taking the language of graffiti, which is a kind of a, a, a language of art in public space, and reconceiving the canvas as a public wall and sort of this pulling of this logic of graffiti into the space of the museum. Um, then there's this. This is what, this is the opening of the show, okay? I have to say, when this went up, like, so you walk into this, which is Hans Hacke's oil portrait of Ronald Reagan. And I actually thought, it's a good thing I don't work at the MCA Chicago, because I could get fired. <laughs> uh, in the era when all of the one percenters who support museums are in love, they love Ronald Reagan, love him. I showed this. Okay, so what is this? So in 1982, Hans Hacke is invited to Documenta in Kassel, Germany. And the curator of that Documenta was a man named Rudy Fuchs, who um, in 1982 uh, put out a press release for the Documenta talking about um, the ongoing uh, transcendent qualities of painting. And Hacke basically went kind of like, Ape shit, and he was installing a piece already. And when he read Rudy Fuchs's um, comments about painting in the press, he decided that he would make Rudy Fuchs an oil painting. And so this is Hans Hacke's oil painting of Ronald Reagan, done within a few short days, which is also really funny for those of you who know Hacke's work. Like nobody saw a completely realistic portrait of Ronald Reagan coming out of Hans Hacke's hand. He, of course, went through classic Beaux-Arts arts training and knew how to paint a physical likeness of a human being. Painted this painting, and it's installed on this red wall. It's got the little clip lamp over the gold frame. It has the requisite red uh, thing in front of it, and it is connected by virtue of the uh, red carpet which I realize now we only associate with the Oscars, but actually has a more political dimension in other arenas. And across from it is installed an enormous photo blow up. Now, when the piece is installed in Germany, what the photo blow up is a picture of a huge demonstration in Bonn that was uh, organized by uh, average German citizens in opposition to Ronald Reagan's proliferation of nuclear warheads in Europe. Uh, when it's shown in the States, it is the 1982 march against nuclear uh, proliferation in, in nuclear arms in Central Park. So what you have is a competing version of, the, of what art is and what the public sphere is. You have an oil painting and a kind of classic museum presentation, or you have the language of photojournalism blown up to the level of spectacle. And so as a viewer, you are sort of in some ways caught in between these two versions of the public sphere, the museum as a classic bourgeois institution of the public sphere, and the people on the street, right? This older sort of enlightenment model, you know, of like the people united, you know, they can't be divided, all that kind of stuff. But Hakka's two, 
he's too smart to let you stay in this false dichotomy between the street and the museum, right? Because what we are seeing is actually a news image with these huge sprockets. So what we understand is that there is no sort of pure public because the public is always being framed and always being turned back and represented to itself. And always now, all everything will be represented in the media. And so there's this idea of this kind of intensely mediated public space that happens. Um, sneaking behind this wall, what would happen is you would see, so you would see Reagan from 82, and then behind that is David Hammond's How You Like Me Now from 1989. Okay, here's the funny story of the talk. I have a graduate student working with me as a research assistant on the project. He come, I ask him, can you go and find this piece by David Hammond's How You Like Me Now? I think it's 1989. He comes back with the Xerox image. He says, I don't understand why we have to have this picture of Bill Clinton in the show. <laughs> That's Jesse Jackson in whiteface. Jesse Jackson ran for president in 1988 as the uh, head of the Rainbow Coalition. As we all know, William Jefferson Clinton was the first black president of the United States. <laughs> this is a very funny moment in the research. Um, the David Hammond's piece, How You Like Me Now, is opposite um, this other piece by John Ahern called Raymond and Toby. These are two works of public art, uh, both from 1989. Both are installed outside, both by artists deeply committed to a kind of political or socially engaged practice. And both works of art are attacked. They are refused by the public. And one of the things that becomes clear in this moment um, the How You Like Me Now was attacked by a group of African-American construction workers with sledgehammers who found the image to be racist. They did not know that the artist himself was African-American. And the John Ahern was made um, as a cast of people. He lived in the South Bronx. He made casts of his neighbors in the South Bronx. And the Public Art Commission of New York asked if he would make three sculptures for outside of the police plaza in the South Bronx, so in that neighborhood. So this statue was put outside the police station in the neighborhood in which this person lived, and the ladies of the neighborhood went apeshit, refused. Like, this is not the image of our community that we are interested in. This is an image of a thug, and we will not have it. So one of the things that happens in the 80s is that we begin to become aware that we have these ideas of community or the public and that they are a monolithic projection of a certain set of ideas of people onto other people. They might be well-intentioned, but as we all know, sometimes well and in good intentions are really problematic. So this idea of the public as a sort of profoundly fractured concept as opposed to a unitary one becomes something that I think artists are really struggling with during this period. The other thing that's in this section is, um, one of the things that happens in the 1980s is that what many of us long believed to be true in a conspiracy theory way, which was that the American government was supporting despotic regimes in Latin America, was proven once and for all with the Iran-Contra affair. And so, I pulled together um, groups of artworks by Latin American artists who are obviously working under very different conditions than their American um, compatriots because they have to work with strategies of silence, whereas um, the American artists are able to work with strategies of speech. And so um, here you see this incredible Leon Golub painting from 1980 right next to a stack of Doris Salcedo um, starched and, and painted shirts from 1989. So you have a very, very different set of strategies about what do you do in the face of um, a democratic regime on the one hand that supports dictatorships 
and what other kinds of strategies are available to you as an artist when you live under a dictatorship. Um, the democracy section ends with works that really point to and are about and emerge from the um, most dramatic movement for social change of the period, which is ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Um, ACT UP was filled with artists who brought all of the art strategies of um, representation to this protest movement. Um, and again, I think similar to how many artists are actually involved in the Occupy movement and like thinking um, very, very creatively uh, in terms of strategies of resistance. Okay, the third section, gender trouble. Um, this section includes works that engage with the implication of the 1970s feminist movement, expanding our understanding of the social construction of gender roles. In the 1980s, artists influenced by feminism began to challenge the category woman, arguing that it was too homogenous, positing instead that identity is equally inflected by race, sexuality, class, as well as other more individual forms of difference. Um, I'm just assuming that feels kind of right to the pe like people in the room. That if I asked now like that all the women get up, that you'd be a lot more pissed than when I said like all the people who were born after 1980 get up. I'm just assuming that if I asked right now all of the women to stand, people would be like, what the fuck? <laughs> I don't have to do that. But you all stood up like really, oh, I was born after 1980. <laughs> That'll change though. One day you'll be like, I'm not standing up. I'm old. Okay, but why would you be pissed or irritated or at least suspicious? And I think you would be all of those things because perhaps you would no longer be satisfied with a biologically based explanation of the difference between the sexes. Tyler Perry notwithstanding. Um, I think one of the questions that 1980s feminism asked that was different than 1970s feminism is 80s feminism asked, is, and this is reductive, but I think true, how do we come to find ourselves as gendered people in the world? What are the ramifications of that gendering on our ideas and on our desires? And one of the things that is developing during this period is the idea of gender as a set of performances and poses. Now, another way to bracket the period, 79 to 92, punk to Clinton. In 1980, Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party opens at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. In 1990, Judith Butler publishes Gender Trouble. That is 10 short years, people, to go from the dinner party, which basically, you know, is the big, like, all us women are going to get up now and leave the room, go and have a woman's talk, to Judy Butler, which is a very different version of gender, right? In which I understand that gender is a set of um, strategic positions that I occupy and that perform me at any given moment. Right, um, and that is a that is a profound shift in feminist thinking in a very relatively short period of time. Now, I think artists actually were at work on gender trouble all through the '80s, and one of the arguments of the show is that it's precisely um, because artists are at work on these ideas that Judy Butler that the conditions of possibility arise for her to write Gender Trouble. So she doesn't come to it alone. I actually think she comes to it because so many artists are already doing this work. So as artists explored this idea, they looked to the history of images, focusing specifically on photography, the, the basis of mass media, advertising, and pornography, all of which produce seemingly infinite images of women. Investigating the role such images played in the creation of gender, 
Some artists sought to debunk images of masculinity as heroic and suffused with authority. Others explored the physicality of the body, its limits and frailty, sidestepping the problem of gender temporarily and contemplating the increasing loss of life due to AIDS. Um, so this is, this is actually one of my favorite pre-slides because I realized that whenever we talk about feminism and whenever we talk about gender, we are always talking about women. And I am just done with that. I want to talk about men. And these four images just really move, I find them very moving because I find what they imply is that when women ask for equality in the 1970s, they weren't actually asking for like equality to be like men. They weren't act asking for some sort of abstract idea that we would all now be men together. It wasn't like, the, you know, like an Iron John novel. Like it was, it was actually that we were all going to have to rearrange ourselves in relationship to patriarchy and that that would entail for men enormous loss. And I think one of the things you see in these portraits is that, that loss, is that fragility, is the loss of what does it mean when you lose your moorings uh, in the patriarchy. These are all in the wrong order, by the way. So the, the um, how many of you know this picture? Good, good. This is a great picture. This is Jeff Wall's picture for women. Um, and I think it is one of the things I'm talking about is making the Judy Butler argument possible. So. As I understand Butler's gender trouble, one of the things she's saying is that she's thinking about unmooring gender from a body and seeing gender as a set of structural positions rather than as like this kind of dumb biological fact that there's nothing to do about. And I think Jeff Wall's picture for women really explores those kinds of ideas because it both stages and undermines the classic idea in Western art that women are the object of the gaze and that men are the active gaze, right? So that women are passive and that men are active and that the male position is to look and the female position is to be looked at. And certainly you have that situation here. The male artist, Jeff Wall, so this is also a self-portrait, uh, is looking at the female model who is his subject. And yet the female model looks out at us um, evoking, of course, the great Manet painting, the girl at the bar at the Folie Bergère. She looks at us. She is active. She possesses a gaze, however bracketed and wary her occupation of that gaze might appear. Um, but of course, she is looking in a mirror. So not only is she looking out at us, but in looking in the mirror, she is looking back at him. And the way you know it's a mirror. Does this work? Oh, I love this. I love this moment. I never get to do this. I don't teach. So um, that's the name of the camera, but it's in reverse. That's how you know that this is a mirror, that little moment. I love this. It's right there. OK, and so who has, however, the most steady gaze in this image? It's the camera unblinking, dead center in the middle of the frame, capturing all of it, not only the maker, the putative object, the mise-en-scene, the space behind, the mirror, right? The camera takes this sort of mono, monocular vision, takes everything in, absorbs everything, is capable of absorbing and reproducing everything in the space, every kind of position. And so because the camera is offered, I would argue, is like completely equal. This is fun to do, too. Um, as the two pic people in the um, image, one of the things we begin to see is that the, the positions of being looked at and looking are structural. They're structural conditions. We're in it right now. 
right? It's a, it's, a it's a construction and it's a structural condition. But we can shift within and out of those conditions so that they are cultural and fluid and that we are fluid within them. Um, and I think that that is really one of the most kind of amazing things that happens in the work of the 1980s. Um, in addition to that kind of unmooring of gender from the body, one of the things that comes up is the rise of abject art and this, again, this kind of fragility of the body that happens. Um, and then here you see this installation here of Tony Craig's St. George and the Dragon and Gober Sink and that Carol Dunham just kind of crazy. There's a lot of assholes in this painting. This is going to be fun. Yes. I have to point them out to you because you might not be able to see them otherwise. <laughs> All right, and what you have hanging across, this is a crazy two slide situation, but this is Mike Kelly's More Love Hours Than Can Ever Be Repaired hanging across from Schnabel's great um, portrait of Andy Warhol. And then the other kinds of images that one would encounter in the gender trouble section were um, pictures by Jimmy DeSana and pictures of Lee Bowery, who was this sort of extraordinary um, human performance event that happened in London, and Nan Golden's Ballad of Sexual Dependency. And what I saw in these were all ways of living out. Li if we're going to unmoor gender from bodies, uh, our intimate relations and our relations to our bodies are going to be really different. And so this is part of the great experiment of the 1980s, was um, living out some of these new ideas. The last section of the show is called Desire and Longing. We live in a society saturated with mass media images designed to fill us with desire. Artists during the 1980s were intrigued by the strength of such images. And while some found them enthralling, Others sought to dismantle them in order to critique the mass media's relentless command to consume. Within this milieu, appropriation developed as the central artistic strategy of the 1980s. And appropriation compri is comprised of various techniques, such as rephotographing the work of others, using commodities or everyday objects in sculpture, and using photographs as the basis for paintings. Ironically, by using such techniques, Artists also expose their own desires for uniqueness and individuality, for Hollywood style fame, for artistic greatness, luxury goods, or sexual prowess, suggesting that such desires, however manufactured, are in fact really difficult to resist. Um, and this is again, I think, another like revisionist move that might be hard to read if you don't have a, a received version of the 80s under your belt. But the received version of the 80s under one's belt was that appropriation was a critical strategy designed to undermine the very desires that those objects and images were designed to create. I have to say, 20 years on, it's hard for me to be totally invested in that on criticism only logic. I think that if you're using images of the Marlboro Man, you might also have some desires around the Marlboro Man. Um, that it's just that, that it's just not that easy to be outside of the great desiring engine that is our culture. That it's just impossible, I would argue even, to live outside of um, the proliferation and the demand to consume. Um, that being said, desire runs rampant through 80s art. So you have Sophie Kahl hiring a detective to follow her. And then she chose the detective, her favorite version of Paris, because she wants the detective to fall in love with her, which I basically read as like the desire to be inside a romantic movie. Or you have the Jeff Koons rabbit, which I think for many people is the iconic object of the period, right? And it is an amazing object because 
it sees you looking at it and you see yourself looking at it and you see everything in the room in it and it sees you back. <laughs> I look good. I look good here in the museum looking at things. I look good here in the museum as a postmodernist critical subject, <laughs> unmoored from my gender, <laughs> above consumer desire. Um, I think a lot of artists in the 1980s were also really desirous of fame. I think uh, the 80s is the great, it, the, the 80s is the moment where Warhol really becomes Warholian you know, and where the model of the artist set forward by Warhol um, as a kind of purveyor, as a sort of chic and ironic purveyor and consumer of culture is meets, you know, really sort of comes into its fullness of being. But the other form of desire that of course emerges in the 1980s is a very explicit visual regime of gay, lesbian, um, and queer desire. There's a sense on the part I think of the queer of queer artists that um, they want to be in the picture, they want to see themselves in the picture, they want pictures of their desire. One of the things that AIDS meant was that queer people really felt like the language of being tolerated was over, right? That we were, in fact, here, queer, and you had to get used to it, as the slogan went. That desire, of course, turned into longing as so many people died. Uh, and as desire got transformed from something that you might want to something that you, in fact, can never have, which is a time before the crisis and for um, people's return uh, from the dead. Um, so just to go through a few of the ideas, you know, Sherry Levine is often discussed as a kind of feminist critique of authorship, originality, uniqueness, and the masterpiece. But I became really interested in the idea that Sherry Levine has never recopied a bad work of art in her life. She only copies great works of art. And that that had to be in part about a kind of desire to occupy that sort of position. Um, I did things like this in the show where I showed this amazing Heim Steinbach next to a Mary Kelly. And if Mary Kelly could fire me, she probably would. Um, but again, trying to hold together the language of very different notions of what a critical artwork might be and to show that within that kind of criticalness, there is always the desire of the artist is at play and trying to figure out how we might be, start to talk about the desire of the artist. Um, and then the other thing that this section did was really try and hold together the logic of appropriation artists and the desire that those images have, like the, the Laurie Simmons little dollhouse images, which I actually see as being very desirous of a certain kind of bourgeois interior, even while you're critiquing it, next to these Peter Hujar photographs of um, these beautiful portraits of gay men from the um, West Village art scene. I'm just trying to hold these two very different forms of imaging of desire together to see what happened if they rubbed up against one another a little bit. Um, and then that's, uh, that's the final installation shot I have for you. But again, trying to hold together um, the kind of use of the ready-made that's so saturated with desire that you see in the Coons Bunny, and then this other use of the ready-made the Felix Gonzalez Torres clocks hanging up on the wall or the David Wojnarowicz photograph of the diorama in the Smithsonian. So three different ready-made strategies signaling three very different sorts of um, relationships of desire and loss, visibility and legibility. Like who gets to be seen, where and when and under what conditions. Um, I'm going to stop.
I'm happy to take um, questions or listen to comments if people have them. I felt like a lot. We'll wait and let them leave. I don't want them to hear your question. <laughs> All right, they're gone. Ask away. Right. yet because the people who, um, well, let me back up. Um, a couple of, about, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, um, I was writing a text that was de designed to debunk some big idea from the October group. And um, it wasn't working. No one from that group was reading the text and feeling debunked. <laughs> and I was feeling like a failure. And I told my friend this, and she said, oh, well, you can't write for them. You don't write for the people older than you. You have to write for the people younger than you. Because the people who are older than you will never change their mind. And so what you need to do is try to pull through ideas from your elders that are crucial. And I think one of the things the project is trying to do is a little bit of recuperation of the term of postmodernism, which is a term that has fallen into total disrepair. And it's a disrepair that I think speaks to the kind of traumatic silence around the 80s. So it's an attempt to pull that through but to also recast it in ways that are not as, um, I would argue, moralistic as some of those arguments calcified into. Um, and for those of you who don't know that argument, that, I mean, there, there's a moment where Hal Foster writes a, a really brilliant text called R.E. Post, you know, about Post, in which he says there are two kinds of postmodernism. There's the postmodernism of the critical kind, so the super savvy, ironic use of appropriation that shows you your desire and critiques that, the creation of that desire. And then there's the bad postmodernism, complicit postmodernism, which basically views the end of history as a kind of playground in which anyone can take anything from any period and just create a pastiche. And that, that is, that's, and that's like Michael Graves. And then, like, you know, good postmodernism was Sherry Levine. And while that was a brilliant article, because it actually did allow you to see, oh, there are different versions of postmodernism happening. What happened to that argument over time was that it got calcified. And people actually started talking about good and bad postmodernism, which meant that they began to moralize art objects, which is something I'm really wary of, right? Um, and um, so I don't expect a warm welcome from some of the people uh, who, whose ideas in some ways I'm like kind of, you know, spitting spitballs at. Um, 
if anything, my, my, ho my, own, my own hope for the project is much more like naive and stupid, which is that, that um, in an art market dominated by ideas of um, money and professionalism and fame and success that, that um, this is a view onto a period in which it felt like what one did really ma mattered. You know, there, there was a kind of urgency um, that um, was in part born because people were dying. You're very, you feel more urgent when your friends are dying. There's no question. Um, but also there was an urgency because I think we felt that there were certain big ideas really were ending and that there was room to make new ideas. Um, and there was something about, I mean, this has been a five-year project, and there's been something fairly demoralizing to me about the last five years, about that felt like just a, a closing down of those, that sense of possibility of what art and culture could do. Um, and so if anything, my aspirations are much, much more um, for, for, a, for younger people to take up the work than for, um, for what Hal thinks about it. <laughs> I'm a Hal Foster student. I love Hal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my, uh, because you talk about desire and longing, so I find this a very um, interesting um, kind of opening to sort of from my noticing the affect that is also invested in your um, curatorial work. Mm -hmm. And um, I frankly found this um, exhibition beautiful, but also uplifting. I, I found um, there's a kind of affirmative quality to it, and that is interesting, especially because you open the talk with such a dramatic um, mm. uh, um, you know, uh, framing right, of the uh, crisis. So I was wondering if in somewhere when you were working on this project that was partially uh, the intention, the way something is being affirmed here that seems to me also powerful. Mm. Mm -hmm. or what exactly is being affirmed, but I feel that something is being affirmed, and I think that that affirmation might have something to do with the sense of self and uh, agency that you're mm. describing just now, in the sense of feeling empowered to do something. And I don't know if that's how you would see this. Um, um, that's really beautiful. Thank you for that comment. Um, I don't think I understood while I was organizing the exhibition. Um, I actually didn't understand how beautiful it would look physically. I thought it was going to be very ugly and messy. Um, and I was actually quite surprised by it, its physical pleasure, its visual and physical pleasure. Um, and I'm not still quite sure what to make of that even in, in, in myself in terms of my own curatorial work. But I do think that, I mean, while I never would have used the word af affirmative, probably because I'm a little sort of allergic to, um, you know, I, trained as a modernist, I, I, like, I, I believe in negation. You know, I can't like have, the affirmative is like, That's like what you do in yoga, <laughs> is you, you, you constantly affirm, you know, I came to the mat. Um, but I do think that the affect that you're discussing um, 
is something that was really palpable in the, in the exhibition space. And I think that that affect was one of um, uh, th there was an affect of, I don't know how else to say it other than in some way what I've already said, which was that what was affirmed by the artwork in the show and by the artistic practices represented in the exhibition was a profoundly deep belief that culture matters, that culture is a place where ideas get worked through and worked out, that we are not, as cultural producers, a reflection of the society, but that rather we are, in fact, part of the generative engine of what is possible. And so that sense that artists were at work on the ideas and principles of gender trouble prior to Butler's uh, elucidation of that argument felt very, very strong. Or that the idea that it was artists who understood this tension between a kind of classic version of the public sphere taking place outside in the street um, or this more sort of bourgeois notion, institution of the public sphere like the museum and the new mediated public sphere of television and the mass media, that since artists were already working in that terrain, when ACT UP emerged in 87, it understood all sorts of things about representation and protest. It understood what to do. It understood that it wasn't going to be enough merely to stop traffic that you had to stop traffic in a way that captured the news media's attention. You know? And so that, that the work that had been happening in the art world in a seemingly unremarked upon way in Soho right, actually came to fruition in these other cultural iterations. And the sense that um, what was at stake was um, again, to frame it in terms of the democratic possibility, right, of, of um, that what is always at stake is a more ethical culture, a more ethical society. And that, I think, um, really did end up feeling like that there is this version of the 80s that's bombastic and excessive and decadent, you know, Schnabel walking around in his pajamas in Soho. You know, this is a retarded image of, of, of excess. But that, um, that that image of excess is an all too convenient image as the dominant image of the 80s. That in fact, there's this other thing happening um, that is really, really powerful, you know? And it was a time, I think, when people felt, um, People felt committed to the public sphere. They felt committed to its institutions. And, and that criticism is um, it's a form of love. You know, To be critical of, your, of power is actually a, a, a kind of expression of love. You know? So that, that was there in the show in ways that were actually really great. Yeah. yeah. No, no, because I really, I, I, there's a big part of me that is like this to Mary Kelly. Like I worship the ground that woman walks on uh, because she, she taught me a lot. You know, the postpartum document is an amazing work of art, you know, and, um, 
And actually, this work from the 80s is also very amazing. I don't mean to needle Mary Kelly. What I mean to do, even though I think I, I probably, that her reaction to this installation might have been needling. I, I mean, that she might have felt needled. Um, I have, I think I'm, I don't know how to organize my thoughts. One of the things for me that feels really different about being an art historian who works in a museum versus an art historian who works primarily in the academy is that I'm really interested in, as I said at the beginning of the talk, the way in which I can make objects behave in a PowerPoint that I cannot make them behave in real life. That, the, that there is a kind of excess of meaning in the object that always there is always like this surfeit of, of meaning. And one of the things that happened when we were moving the Mary Kelly and the Heimstein back around is that the minute they were next to each other, and this is like this apocryphal, stupid curator language, they like wanted, to, they wanted to be next to each other. This is how we talk. like we immediately anthropomorphize the objects and impugn to them our own desires. Like clearly, <laughs> I wanted them to be next to each other. But in the installation, I was convinced that they wanted to be next to each other. And I think that they wanted to be next to each other because the strategies that they're deploying are actually remarkably similar. Like the level of manufacture by someone else is incredibly high and incredibly perfect. The text in the Mary Kelly is all about how this friend of hers comes to meet her for lunch and says that she looks older but that she really likes her handbag. And so like for the whole lunch the, 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 the paragraph is basically recounting this like reeling thing like oh my god I'm not pretty anymore I, I don't look like this but at least she thinks I have good taste. And then, of course, the Steinbeck is about, like, what is taste? What is good taste? How does taste work? How are we able to use taste as this lever to get in and out of this manufactured desire? And so all of a sudden, they, they felt like they were about similar, a similar problem. Um, and they didn't feel as as different as they were supposed to feel. They actually felt like um, similar approach. It was like Iron Chef. <laughs> it was like Iron Chef. There you go. I didn't mean to needle Mary Kelly. I just put her in an Iron Chef competition in which the material on the table was desire. And then you have two artists. And Louise Lawler, all the way um, on the right there, playing with yet another, like, the inextricability of taste and desire in terms of thinking about our subjectivities. So I didn't, I, did, I didn't mean to needle her, but I knew the minute it happened that it was perverse. Uh, I mean, except Eugene, of course. <laughs> no, I don't think that there is one. And I think actually the 80s and postmodernism is this moment when the very idea of a center um, becomes a kind of untenable idea. Because the center always implies a margin, and a center margin relationship implies a kind of hierarchy. And I think one of the things that postmodernism was interested in was are there ways of um, organizing ourselves um, that are not hier hierarchical, right? I mean, it, this is the moment where we're thinking, where we begin to start thinking ideas that are now, I think, much more prevalent around, you know, the difference between verticality and horizontality as modes of organization. Um, and what does it mean to no longer have this idea that there is a central distribution site or a central reception site uh, in a culture that is so mediated um, and that that form of that mediation now even way, way more than then is um, one of 
of um, like it's it's a rhizome. You know, there's no center in a rhizome. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. <laughs>